Pediatric Variations of Nursing Interventions, Chapter 22. We're looking at just selected parts from this chapter, so uh, look at the page numbers. This, I think, is a great picture. See how the nurse is keeping one hand on the child as she reaches for something else? I would say if you can't be touching the child and reaching for what you're trying to get, you need to pull the, the rail up. I don't just put my hand on top of the child like she's doing. I actually wrap my fingers loosely um, around the arm or the leg. So if that child did go somewhere, I could grab a hold pretty easily. We don't want to learn that the child uh, can roll when we didn't think they could. Okay, informed consent. Who gives informed consent in pediatrics? Well, uh, the parent does. But what does the child have to give? We're supposed to get assent from an older child or a teenager, and that means that we just ask them verbally if they know what's happening and that they're okay with it. That's assent, that they agree to it. They're informed and they agree, even though their parents are the ones who are signing the actual consent. When you do have a parent signing a consent, make sure they understand what they're doing. It's best to use a comfortable setting, not at the bedside where there's beeps and you know they're watching the child and they're distracted. Best to have a separate room and really give them time to understand what's going on. Now, uh, talking about informed consent, uh, it can be the legal parent or the parents or the legal guardian of the child. If you have a teen parent, they are an emancipated minor. By being a parent themselves, even though they're a minor, they are the legal person to sign consents for their child. And um, the mature minors doctrine, this says that um, for STDs, for contraceptive services, for pregnancy, or for drug or alcohol abuse, the minor can sign. They don't need the parents signature. And some of you with teenagers are going to say that's not right, right or wrong. That's what the legal, legally, that's what it is. Um, okay, so preparing kids for procedures. And there's some good boxes that have uh, list what we should do in your book. We want to make sure they're psychologically prepared. And there's a couple boxes that show that for different age kids. We want to establish trust and provide support, both for the child and for the family. Now, parental presence um, and support. Should parents be in the room during a procedure? And I would say it depends. If it makes the nurse so nervous that she's not going to get the IV in or um, whatever it is she's doing, probably not a good idea. Uh, hopefully the parents will understand. I always ask parents to not be there and if they really want to be then I let them. But there's a certain age kid, kind of that toddler through preschool age, it's better if the parents aren't there. Uh, we're doing something bad to them probably, uh, or at least it seems bad, scary, if the parent is present, the parent is one of the bad guys doing the bad thing. I've seen kids who after the procedure, the parent goes to pick them up and they cross their arms and make a frown and they won't let the parent hug them because they're mad at the parent because the parent didn't stop the IV or the, the injection or whatever it was. So for that age kids, I think it's really better if the parents aren't in the room they can be the good guy that we get to take the child to after we've done the bad procedure. Many parents want to be there. They just for their own emotions need to see it, need to see what's happening. Um, so I do leave it up to the parent, but I usually suggest that they don't come in. Providing an explanation. Let's make sure the kid knows what is going to happen. If we've got dolls, uh, let's show them on the doll exactly what's going to happen. Uh, physical preparation, if this is something that's going to be terribly painful, hopefully we're going to sedate them. 
uh, at Children's there is a conscious sedation assessment sheet. Um, now that everything's electronic, I imagine that sheet still exists, but somewhere on the electronic form. And that needs to be filled out and, and kept records on that during any conscious sedation. Um, there's also things like Emla cream that you can put on the site. It takes about 30 to 60 minutes and it numbs the site so that it's not so painful. So think about what physical preparations need to be done. And then when we're doing a procedure on a child, expect success. Go in telling the child, one poke. Don't say, this is my first one, I hope I can get it. Act like we're going to get it. The child's going to be a little bit reassured by that. If you don't get it, we apologize and say, I'm so sorry, I'm going to have to do it one more time. Um, but if you go in not acting like you're going to get it, you've made this kid far more scared. Involve the child as much as possible um, and provide distraction. I always talk to the kid about, you know, Dora or Transformers or whatever they like if I'm the person holding so that the person who's actually doing the poking, I'm thinking IVs right now, the person who's starting the IV can concentrate on that and I'm trying to distract the child by talking about something else. And then allow the child to express their feelings. It does hurt. They are scared. I usually say, it's okay to cry. If it hurts, you can cry, but I need you to hold still. I'm going to help you hold still, but go ahead and cry if it hurts. So you know, they have per give them permission um, to express their feelings and pain, if the feeling is pain, but tell them what we do need them to do, which is probably hold still, and that's what we're going to hold them down and help them do that. Now, feeding the sick child. Parents tend to really worry about food um, and that their child's not eating. Well, loss of appetite, that is a common symptom of, of illness. And kids, they don't eat when they're sick. Forcing them to eat, we may just cause nausea and vomiting. Sometimes nausea is worse than anything else. Um, at least I, I think it is. And vomiting. Now they're losing electrolytes in that emesis, they're no better off. They're actually worse off than if we'd not forced them or, you know, gotten them to eat. Not eating can also be a control thing. The kid is in the hospital. We're poking them, starting IVs, doing meds, doing all this stuff that they don't want. The only control they really have is to say, no, I won't eat. Um, so is it a big deal? Not really. On a short-term illness, it's really not an issue. Uh, what is an issue is that they get enough fluids. We do want to chart what they eat, and at Children's Hospital, they don't chart in percents of diet. They don't say, you know, 15% or 25%. They chart two bites pizza, uh, one tater tot. They'll write exactly what the child took rather than an estimate. A percent estimation and then be real careful on your INO for the fluids because that's what really matters. Uh, just on an aside on that nutrition, I don't know if you've been there in the morning, those of you who are morning probably have seen the breakfast cart. They bring the cart around and let the kids pick whatever they want. A little two-year-old will probably pick five sausages, three pancakes, and hash browns and eggs and toast. I mean they've got a meal for the whole family instead of just them so a percent doesn't even make any sense. We let them pick whatever they want. There's so few things they have control of uh, but they always pick you know enough food to feed the family not just themselves. So write down what they ate not you know not a percent. Just kind of reminder with a baby uh, how that stomach is sitting and so it's best for stomach emptying to put them on the right side after eating. Now, fevers. Uh, kids run high fevers. Even with minor illnesses, they'll get very high fevers. So what happens, the infection, uh, some, there are pyrogenic substances. These cause an increase in the set point. This is done through prostaglandins at the hypothalamus. So, so we change the hypothalamic set point of the body, which tells 
the body to make more heat. Remember we said temperature and metabolism go together, so that means we are have increased metabolism, so we need to make sure we're getting enough fluids because that increases the calories they're using and the fluids that go along with that. Now, fever really is not a bad thing. Parents get very worried about that too, uh, but it probably plays a role in enhancing the development of immunity, causing you know us to be immune to certain things. It also probably is part of um, producing white blood cells and just helping you get over the illness. So it's not that's bad a thing as parents feel like it is. But parents do worry when there's a fever. The main reason we treat fever in kids is just for comfort. They'll be laying on the couch and feeling horrible. You get that fever down, they're up and playing. Antipyretics, what do they do? They lower that set point. They bring it back down. Um, we can use both Tylenol, which is your acetaminophen, and ibuprofen, which is Motrin. At Children's, we always retake the temp 30 to 60 minutes after you've given an antipyretic. We can, uh, or we also will do cooling measures, and mostly this means taking the sheets off, keeping the child in one light um, outfit. Don't put them in, you know, heavy jammies with several blankets. That's going to trap the heat, and kids with that larger surface area, it's going to make their temperature higher. So keep them uncovered. A baby can be in just a diaper. And that's as long as they don't shiver. Shivering is the body's way of increasing metabolism and increasing the, the temperature. So if they start shivering, we want to put another blanket on them or something. We want to prevent shivering. Cooling measures, if they really do have a high fever, hyperthermia, you know, 104 for a length of time or 105, then we can put them in a tepid bath, not cold. We're trying to prevent that shivering. Uh, so it should be lukewarm. You know, tepid is the, the term we usually use, not cold where they're going to shiver. And the reason um, we get this down, metabolic rate increases 10% for every one degree that the temperature rises and, and our um, yeah, uh, so we need to get that down. Um, okay, infection control. At Children's Hospital, you'll see the gel in, gel out signs on all the doors. That's what we do. Gel going in and gel going out, and they have people designated to watch and track how many people do and don't do that. And you'll see, you know, 85%, 90% compliance. Don't let us be the non-compliance, please. And whatever infection control signs are on the patient's door, we need to follow those. For everybody, we're going to do gel in and gel out, and then whatever else they have up there. We would like you to use the full garb that it says to use, even if the nurses don't. They'll go in for just a second, not touch anything, and come out. You'll go in, get distracted, and do stuff. So put on the gown even if you think you're just going in and not touching anything. Oral medication. Um, actually, I think I'm going to stop here and save this because I'm out of time. <laughs>